Oh, not right now. Here, just take it. It is, it is great to see so many people out here for this special evening. We're glad that, that you have made the effort to come. I know some of you have come from long distances, and we really appreciate that. And, uh, and for those of you who are close by, we appreciate you coming, too. Um, we, are, we are going to be in by singing hymn number 87, uh, God is Love. And uh, so we have, uh, we have John on the piano, and Alex is going to conduct. And after that, Dean Stonehawker is going to give our opening prayer. So look it up in your phones and there there are some hymn books over there in the corner, but I figure all of you have phones. Thank you. 
feel here um, that this is a, a, a safe and warm going place. Um, we are uh, we are going to start off with a special musical number. Um, Levi Levitt has uh, has brought all of his equipment here, <coughs> and uh, so we're going to. Uh, he explained to me that his uh, acoustic guitar is uh, in Hawaii, and so he brought the the, uh, the, the, heavy the amped duty. up version. Yeah, the heavy duty instruments. The only replacement I could find. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be singing a song that uh, he wrote. In that way, it's kind of like the Lord's work. He just takes what we give him. You know. <laughs> so we're all going to cross our Jesus fingers together. <laughs> I think there's a rule in uh, in like the Mormon chapels that you can't play any instrument that's supposed to be uh, that's supposed to be amplified. So it's really nice to play for the harp where we can do that.
So, thank you, Levi, for, for sharing that. Um, we asked uh, we asked Tom Christofferson to fly in from uh, Utah to introduce our speakers. They are so special. We needed to get a special guy here to introduce them. So I'd like to invite Tom up to introduce Allison and George.
so just so you know. Um, so I appreciate the invite to come tonight and share with you a part of our story. I hope as I speak to you that you will know of my appreciation for the support that I've had the past nine months tomorrow. You know, I always thought that nine months would be for a beautiful baby. It was short, and this has been the longest nine months of my entire life. Um, and I don't even get a beep yet, but an interesting thing has happened since Stockton has passed away. And I've had a lot of LGBT people reach out to me. And one common theme that comes from that is would you talk to my parents? And these are people that I don't know. And I don't know their parents. I may be a Facebook friend with them. And I think, what am I going to tell their parents? I would be more apt to use a two by four than I would to write a letter. <laughs> and so my talk actually started as a letter to a mother of a gay young man who has been alienated from his family and who wants so desperately to be included with his, with his family. And so as I was writing this email to this mother, I said, this is my talk. And so I will share it with you. Um, if I could sing a song, I would open with a song from the Broadway show Wicked. I'm sure you are all familiar with the song, For Good. But as I've prepared this talk, these words have stood out. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn. And we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them. And, and we help them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true. But I know I am who I am today because I knew you. It well may be that we will never meet again in this lifetime. So let me say before we part, so much of me is made of what I learned from you. You'll be with me like a handprint on my heart. Like a ship blown from its mooring by a wind off the sea, like a seed dropped by a skybird in a distant wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better? Because I knew you, because I knew you, I have been changed for good. And not only, not only applies to my son, but all of those that I've had the honor of knowing in the LGBT community, that I have been changed for good. Sorry, my nose is, and my eyes are running. I'd like to share a little bit about my son and some of you that were at Stockton's funeral. I've taken some pieces out of my funeral talk that I gave. Um, our son Stockton was a long-awaited gift in our home. He was adopted and was adored by us and his two doting older sisters. He was always a light in the home and with lots of love and character. For as long as I can remember, he was a hugger and loved to give kisses. I often told him he was born in my heart, a heart that I knew had the capacity to love without conditions, but had no idea where our journey would take us. Little did I know that this beautiful baby boy was about to stretch my heart in ways I didn't think were possible. This was the beginning of my personal transformation and that of our family. And I conveniently can never give a talk without forgetting something. And so I did forget. I have, I go to Africa every year 
And if any of you are familiar, they have what's called a kente cloth. And they weave the kente cloth one color at a time. And it's many bright and colorful colors. I had one with me. But um, after spending time in Africa over the last years, I've loved that beautiful African kente cloth. The cloth is woven color by color to make a beautiful piece of art. And so it was with Stockton. He was a beautiful, vibrant th thread that brought color, adventure, love, and spontaneity to our lives. His talents were in abundance. Our family, begin, our family quilt began to have pieces that came together from Stockton to create a beautiful family heirloom. Before I knew Stockton's likes and dislikes, orientation, stubborn personality, and crazy zest for adventure, he was a large piece of the family quilt. My son was not a threat to our family, but a vibrant color that was woven beautifully into the family quilt of love. So often this beautiful being was the one who offered the extra hug and kiss to others and the apology when he had done something wrong. He was a peacemaker. He taught us to love deeper and to reach further in every aspect of life. As he grew older, he continued to show love by standing by those in need, looking for the outsider while silently suffering himself. Stockton has and will always be the one who taught our family to love more freely without judgment and a love for everyone. We had the beautiful opportunity to become involved with the LGBT community and there Stockton found his tribe. I recall the first conference he attended and met other teens and both George and I commented on the fact that we finally saw the light back in Stockton. In the words of Chieko Okazaki, no act of compassion is ever futile or wasted. Each choice to act from tenderness feeds our own spirits and becomes a conduit by which the pure love of Christ can spill into a world hungry for such transforming and bounding and infinite love. We saw that amongst our friends, his friends and allies in the community, and Stockton loved that about his tribe. Although Stockton had found his tribe, he also had a longing for a community and belonging. He would often say to me, what is so wrong with me that I can't have friends? He wanted to know and feel a sense of belonging with those he cared for and those he associated with. I believe with all these situations, there's a lay layering effect of our lives and a culmination of experiences. Sorry, I can't see my eyes are getting blurry. Knowing my son as I do, I believe his pain must have been immense for him to ultimately take his life. So there, this is where my life has been changed forever. It's been difficult for our family to be without our son. And the heartbreak we experience has been life altering. As I mentioned, I believe there's a layering effect with my son's death. But do know that my son did not feel loved by his peers, by his community, or within the walls of the church. He also did not feel a constant pull welcoming him in. It seemed we had forgotten the one while serving the 90 and 9. I hope to honor my son by helping bridge that gap that often occurs between LDS members and their LGBT brothers and sisters. was I Choose Love. I knew that was going to be the title because as an active LDS member of the church, that was exactly what I was taught. No matter the choices my son made or the path he chose to follow, I knew that if I led with love, my son would know without fail he was loved just as the Savior loves. 
I realized by loving without condition, it was I who learned a more pure type of love. It took that added burden off my shoulders and allowed my son to know that I loved him. It was our family who has been enriched by having him in our lives, as well as the other LGBT kids that we cross paths with. From the words of Jeff Jeffrey R. Holland, when a battered, weary swimmer tries valiantly to get back to shore after having fought strong winds and rough waves, which he should never have challenged in the first place, those of us who might have had better judgment or perhaps better luck ought not to row out to his side, beat him with our oars, and shove his head back under the water. That's not what boats are made for, but some of us are doing that to each other. Are we doing that to our LGBT brothers and sisters? I certainly believe we, with all my heart, that we as parents would do anything for our children and love them with a depth that only a parent understands. So often with the work that I do, that these, these kids in the LGBT community, that is not what they are hearing and what they are feeling. We are here for a purpose, and that purpose is not to inflict more pain on these kids. I myself had to learn that it wasn't my job to impose my beliefs on my child, but to allow him the experience and be there for a soft place to land, to provide a haven from the storm and teach his siblings and other family members that we will continue to love and support. Oh, how thankful I am that my son left this life knowing he was left just the way he was. I love this quote by Thomas Merton. The beginning of love is to let those we love be perfectly themselves and not to twist those we love or not to twist them to fit our own image. Otherwise, we love only the reflection of ourselves we find in them. My good friend, my favorite Tom Christopherson, also spoke at my son's funeral. And in his talk, he talked about loving perfectly. He says, if our primary focus and object in life is to, have, to love perfectly, then we may discover all the Savior was striving to teach us. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. By this shall men know that ye are my disciple, if you have love one to another. When we seek to love perfectly, our focus is outward. We strive to learn what it is that God loves about each one of his children. Knowledge of our own shortcomings creates a humble desire to aid, to lift, to serve a brother or sister in need, and repels any desire to judge as the hymn teaches, who am I to judge another? When I walk imperfectly, in the quiet heart is hidden, sorrow that the eye can't see, who am I to judge another? In the epilogue of Les Miserables, Fantine sings, to love another person is to see the face of God. When our primary focus is to love perfectly, the crucial elements of living perfectly naturally come along. Humility, hope, patience, faith, long-suffering, loyalty, kindness, and above all, the gift of charity. And who is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with them. He who judges perfectly takes into account not only our actions, but our circumstances, the biology of our bodies, and the chemistry of our consciousness, as well as the desires of our hearts. We cannot know in this life of another what it means to fight a good fight, to finish the course, to keep the faith. I thank Tom for reminding me again and again how I need to be as a mother, a friend, a wife, a sister, and a church member. President Uchtdorf in his April 2016 talk talked about in praise of those who we in praise of those who save. He talks about saving our families. He says every family needs saving. We may share the same gene pool, but we are not the same. We have unique spirits. We are influenced in different ways by our experiences, and each of us ends up different as a result. Rather than attempting to force everyone into a mold of our own making, we can choose to celebrate these differences and appreciate them for adding richness and constant surprises to our lives which my son was really good at. <laughs> he ends with, whatever problems your family is facing, whatever you must do to solve them, the beginning and the end of the solution is charity, the pure love of Christ. Without this, even seemingly perfect families struggle. With it, even families with great challenges succeed. Charity never faileth. 
Stockton wanted to help save those whom he loved, but ultimately was not able to find a way to battle the struggles he had and save himself. I feel strongly this is where we come in as parents, allies, friends, and church members. I, for one, know that I can show more compassion, compassion for those cast on the side of the road, who, road whom the Levite and priest passed by. I can share our covenant to bear one another's burdens, to mourn with those who mourn and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. It is my goal to express more love for and to my LGBT brothers and sisters. As was spoken so well by a friend of mine, Shauna Swartzen, in a Facebook post, she said, don't pretend they are not in your wards, stakes, and families. They are there and need your love. We also need their love. Ask them about their experiences and feelings. These are real people with real lives and feelings. Remember, they are real LGBT, there are real LGBT members in your ward, at church, in the closet, or out. They and their loved ones are there and need you to change how you talk about them and to them. We simply need to love to learn or need to simply learn to love more generously. In the words of Brene Brown, when you practice empathy and compassion with someone, there's not less of these qualities to go around. There's more. Love is the last thing that we need to ration in this world. So I think uh, when Jeff shared that we were speaking, he asked us to title our talk, and it was I Choose Love based off of the talk that I gave at Stockton's funeral, and it was talking about learning to love without boundaries and living with loss. And I kind of thought, well, that's kind of a downer to leave them where I'm at. Um, so, and it was my fault because I picked the title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize, maybe George can do a song and dance at the end, um, because this is where I'm at. And this is real. And this is my life. And I'm living with loss. Um, so this is what you get. <laughs> and did, did you say I was really honest? Yes. Okay. As I thought about sharing my feelings on living with loss, um, I have to say I felt the despair of of wanting to be with my child again. I've never felt so torn. Between two places. My daughter's looking at me like, what am I? <laughs> but it's the I, I can't describe it other than there's a piece of my heart that's gone. Um, I've come to know intimately what a panic attack is, what anxiety feels like, and what it's like not to sleep. The reverse of that is I felt like I know what it's like to love <coughs> and be loved deeper. I'm thankful for my husband and his constant companionship and steady hand. My daughters who have steadied me through my grief and love this new version of mom. My friends who've been willing to step in my grief with me and allow me to share my deepest fears and darkest moments. How do you share these things? <coughs> Without leaving it being turning into a positive, I guess. It's, it's hard for me to. See that silver li lining at times. It's interesting to see what the worst trial of your life will do to your perspective. Yes, I still get up every day, but more mornings than not, that demon has blanketed over me, and I am suffocating on the darkness that embodies him. It's crazy how you were lonely for your old life. 
It seems now that my life has a before and an after. A massive fault line that lies in the middle of what used to be and what now exists. So now I look for steady, firm footing on the other side of the fault in hopes that I can find healing. This quote has resonated with me as I pondered this experience. I thought I would have to teach my child about the world. It turns out I have to teach the world about my child. My child who is no longer on this earth. And it seems so simple. You now I can remember when he came out at 13. You know, George and I just, what are we going to do when he's 16 and wants to date? And how are we going to handle it? And, oh, that's just, you know, too much to think. And all of these things really around in our head. And, you know, it changes the whole perfect little family picture that you have in your mind. And now, what I would give to see him go on his first date. I know he had plenty of first kiss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did get that one. <laughs> I think every young man affirmation was like, can I have that shirt? He kissed me in that shirt. It's like, oh. <laughs> but so we, just so we're clear, he was kissing him. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I did get that one. It was just I felt bad for all the kids that got the first one. I was like, yeah, I think he kissed a few others. Um, <laughs> so I did get that. But, you know, to have to marry, to enjoy a healthy, long, fulfilling life. And I can't continue on without honoring him for the vibrant young man he was and the zest for life he shared with us and those that knew him. I have felt a strong nudge from my son that I need to honor him by reaching out to our LGBT brothers and sisters even more. <clears throat> Words that often come to my mind are urgency, reaching, understanding, compassion, and of course, love. I've sat more with my LGBT brothers and sisters since Stockton's passing. I've heard the following said by parents on several occasions, I'd rather have a dead child than a gay child. First of all, I'm the wrong mom to say that to. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, I hope you realize what you have in that beautiful living God, child of God that is gay. If your relationship isn't where it should be, I hope you'll reconsider your relationship with your child and cherish the moments you have with them by your side. Include them in your family and your extended family. You will find a greater capacity to love and understand. I know it. I know it because I chose love. And I found a greater capacity for love and growth because of it. And for that I am grateful to have had 17 years with my son. As we strive to reach and love one another, I would ask also the LGBT community to love and look after their own. Please create an environment that is healthy, that is inclusive and kind. Be the kind of friend and mentor that you can be proud of. Live life to its fully, fullest, knowing you can be just the way God created you. I realize that it may not always feel this way, but I would hope all will know you have a cheering section and sanctuary with your allies and your own. From the words of my friend John Bonner, speaking of his friends in LDS community, he says, I know their first instinct is to reach out, to assure us that as long as they have a home, we will have a place in it. That when their table is spread, we will always have a seat around it. And that whatever we decide to celebrate our love with that person we've chosen to make a life with, they will be there in the front row applauding louder and weeping more tears of joy than anyone else. Let's commit now as brothers and sisters, regardless as to where we sit at the table, to make a place. One, one, one where everyone knows of each other's love, support, and most importantly, a love of a Savior who knows each one of us personally, who understands our pain and has died, we may live again. 
This life, is experience, this life experience is about finding our way back to love. All the rest is just part of the tough journey we call life. Thank you, Stoughton, for being my teacher. My promise is to learn to love with all my heart. Forgive in ways I thought were not possible. Release anger that no longer serves me and return to meet you again, saying, I did it. I lived for you. I honor your memory by finding joy again. I appreciate the opportunity that I had to come and speak to you. This has really been my first time that I've publicly really talked about Stockton's passing, and so it's kind of emotional for me, so I apologize. But I hope that you will know of my love for not only my son, but for this community that I have been able to be a part of that has included me in their circle. Um, it's an honor for me to be included and be counted amongst friends in this community, and that is something that I do. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm straddling this fence because my connection is gone. It's like my membership expired or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I signed up for life, I promise. You know, I, I'm here, I'm in it. And so I want everybody here to know that you have a cheerleader in me and a supporter and a door that's always open in our home. And so I leave that with you. And in Jesus Christ, amen. I would much rather listen to her than myself. After uh, Tom's comments, mine are completely uncensored. <laughs> <laughs> and since my wife hasn't reviewed these words, you're all in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, it is an honor to be here today. Um, uh, certainly a, uh, an emotional one. Uh, from the moment that Jeff asked Allison and I to speak to this group, um, I thought and thought about this and rewritten words and tried to imagine what I wanted to uh, happen here. And so uh, I hope that um, what I share with you today uh, does several things. Um, most importantly, and above anything else, that you feel love um, just as you are. It is also an honor of mine, as much as it's great to be here with you, more so to be here with my wife. Um, sorry, I lengthen out my talk. I paused like that. She really is my best friend, and, and even more so through this experience, my battle buddy. Uh, I really could talk a lot about her, but before I get in a lot of trouble, I better stay back on focus here. Um, even though Allison and I are, are speaking here separately in our own talks and comments, we are heavily influenced by her, and so a lot of my words are going to come from 
things that I observed and even equally to some degree affected by the LGBT community. Um, it means a great deal for Alice and I to be here to share this message that's uh, deeply personal and important to us. I hope that the Spirit is, is here in attendance and in abundance. I want each of you to feel the deep and abiding, abiding love of God, our Eternal Father and His Son, who loved us all so much that uh, He laid down His life for each of us, for each of our sufferings, doubts, fears, feelings of rejection, abandonment, and our infirmities. So I ask that they attend this moment, this time together. Um, I hope that my precious son will be proud of us. And that he'll accept this. Stockton. You can hear me. <laughs> now that I fully accept you, just as you are, I want you to feel our love for you and appreciation for the beautiful child that you are, just as you are. Stockton, I want you to know that I'm proud of you. I'm certain Stockton is here, and I'm grateful for that. So if I swear, if I tell a terrible dad joke, uh, note that Stockton influenced me. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I'm grateful for that. The things that I will share with you are my experiences, uh, feelings, and even emotions. I have learned a great deal about love through the pain and grief of losing a child. I stand here uh, to openly show and give respect and reverence to my son and all those who are now gone a bit early. I'm not the only one who lost a son, a precious child. Each of you here lost a son, a brother and a friend. Uh, lost are those moments and memories that I personally was ready for. Gone for a time is his laugh and his smile that could light me up in, in the room we were in together. Lost are his dad jokes, which were much better than mine. Just as my child is yours, yours are mine. We are here gathered to raise each other, lift one another, and truly be one a community of love and unity. It is my desire that we will walk away from this moment armed more so with the deep and beautiful power of love, and in doing so, make a significant difference in our marriages, families, friendships, and communities. If you love someone, you are always joined with them in joy, in absence, in solitude, in strife. Follow me. From the moment I set my eyes on my son, I fell in love with him. His infectious smile, laugh, and mischievousness were an instant hit with me. His precious hugs and endearing stare would melt any frustration and would heal any sadness. His light was very powerful, and that continues to be very powerful. Stockton always wanted to do what I was doing, <clears throat> from going for a run to making a protein shake. He wanted to be, be like me, and I loved that. One day I wanted to test this, so I told him that I was going to go for a run. Yes, I'm telling this story. <laughs> Remember, I'm uncensored here. 
told him that I was going to go for a run and to the uh, frustration of my wife, I told him that I was going to go for a run naked. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me several times, making sure that that was really what was going to happen. <laughs> Tell him that he was three, not seventeen. Yeah. <laughs> that would probably be a Did you hear that? He was three. <laughs> so after checking with me several times, went back into his room and came out to the top of the stairs. Yes, naked. <laughs> and yes, I got in a lot of trouble for that. <laughs> I've been running dressed ever since. <laughs> my son and I share a great love for music. I have found myself listening more to the music he loved like Lord. On many occasions I would listen to him practice his guitar in our living room and he had a song that he would sing, one of many that was a favorite of mine, falling solely from the musical once. As he practiced, I would stop him and ask him to play it. He would always oblige me each and every time. As I would listen to him, I could, couldn't help but get caught up in how it felt so personal. For a moment, he would let his guard down. He and I would get lost in that moment together. He expressing himself to me, and, and I would admire his openness and vulnerability. He would always ask me, do you really like it? And once I left myself, I would respond with, wow. He would always smile and was surprised at that response. We all want to be appreciated and valued, seen for what is great about us. We all want to be cheered on. I love these words from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. There is no situation that is not transformable. There is no person who is hopeless. There is no set of circumstances that cannot be turned about by human beings and their natural capacity for love of the deepest sort. Many years ago, my wife approached me and wanted to purchase flower baskets to be placed around our home to add color and beauty. I was at first a bit res uh, resistant when she told me the cost, but as usual in our home, I relented <laughs> and, and quickly appreciated them for many reasons. It became my responsibility to care for those, these flowers and ensure that they received the water that they needed. One day my wife asked me, asked that I remember to water the edges of the baskets. She said, George, please remember to water the edges of these baskets. If you don't, the flowers will die. Little did I know how profound her comments would affect me after Stockton passed. Just, at, just after his funeral, I was out in our yard watering those same flowers. And her words came to me with such force that I began to cry. Those precious flowers on the edge of the flower basket were my son, as well as the LGBT community, put on those edges, marginalized, and abandoned. As I composed myself and took a deep breath, I thought more about the significance of those flower baskets. They're beautiful, all of them. Every part of them. Each basket was filled with so many colors, all adding to the beauty of the whole. I began to think how often we believe, myself included at times, that others must change to be more like us. I thought how drab the flower basket would be if all the flowers were green or the same color, having no variation or difference. Just like my flower baskets, we all need the water and nourishment, love, kindness, and appreciation of our divine design. And just as my flower baskets, there are great beauty and benefits and differences. We are created with differences for a grand and divine purpose. 
He created us with identities after his holy image. And I'm a firm believer that our Father in heaven does not make mistakes. Love is something that we are all born with. We come from the most loving beings, our heavenly parents, our elder brother, Jesus Christ, who gave us the most perfect example of love in his atoning sacrifice. Love is also a choice. We have been blessed with the agency to choose. One of the greatest things that I've ever heard is this, and he commanded them that there should be no contention one with another, but that they should look forward with one eye, having one faith and one baptism, having their hearts knit together in unity and love one towards another. The Father gave us many commandments, but there being no coincidence when he made the first two commandments and their focus, the importance of love. My friends, I choose love. I choose to love you with your strengths and your weaknesses, with your good and your bad and all that might be, whether you be black or white, gay or straight. I love that I can look at you and that I don't need to separate you with labels. We are all children of our deeply loving, caring heavenly parents. They see, value, and love us equally. Through love, all pain will turn to medicine. Discussing the loss of my son is a challenging subject matter. Men don't normally talk about the things that hurt them. <coughs> the grief I have felt is difficult to express as I often le I'm often left wondering how, what, and where I could have been to bring some peace to my son that he might want to remain with us. As a father, I felt great need to not only deeply love my child and all of my children, but to also protect them. The grief I feel includes the struggle of wondering why I needed to protect my son from people that should have treated him differently. I also feel the loss of the community that I thought was and would be so much different in this moment, the one that was going to bear my burdens with me. As much as this is incredibly difficult, I have gained an understanding of what my son felt as I learned through his, this how vital the community can and needs to be. This experience has moved and motivated and inspired me to reach out to the LGBT community and to look at each one as I would look at my own child. The loss of my son has ultimately provided the fuel to raise my words and deeds, seeking to create a safe place, encouraging a community of deep love. I have a Gary Price sculpture in my office in my home titled The Ascent. The sculpture depicts a scene of on a jagged cliff where two Native Americans are climbing this cliff. One is reaching down to the other in a spirit of love. The Indian poet Howard Rainier penned these words in association with the sculpture, and it is titled The Ascent. Grab hold and take this hand that reaches out to you. Look up. Into my eyes, my spirit cries out to you. Friendship is my thought. Let us climb the jagged cliffs of life and fight the ascent of opposition together. If I can lift you today, you will look back and grab the hands of a thousand more. That is the way the great spirit would have it. May we all better enjoy our own flower baskets and see the world that is around us. May we all love without boundaries, appreciating and celebrating the differences in each of us. And thank you for being here with us tonight. And um, I thank you for <coughs> taking some time to share this with us. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. It's the only time she obeyed me in like two weeks. <laughs> so we're supposed to be up here to answer questions. Or not. Or <laughs> Yes. when I was, or when I was talking. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting, 
I don't know. I, right after Sutton passed away, is that the part I you're think, talking yeah, about? So, yeah, I, I, um, I think I, it's kind of hard to explain, but it, you feel like part of you is gone. I think, is that the time you're talking yeah, about? I, or? I think I wrote down that um, maybe part of you feels like you're with your son still, part of you is No, I, I think what I'm trying, was trying to say is that there's, you know, it's a, school we felt like that he needed a change and so we um, we sold our home and then within two weeks Stockton passed away and then we were moving into a new state a new area I mean in Bountiful it's or, you know Utah the stakes are you know one right in a row so we moved into an area where we really haven't been very involved um, I don't know that I felt like it put any more pressure on for change. I, um, I, we were invited back to speak with the state leadership in that state. In our previous state. In our previous state. And, you know, we did have some dialogue with them. But, um, they were. <laughs> okay, I guess it's my turn. Um, I did, we did um, have some experiences with our new ward and new yeah, ward specifically new ward. that were a lot more, um, a lot more open. Um, we had had some pretty significant challenges in our previous ward and state, so it was a pretty stark difference in being open to talk about it and, and those types of things. But I also feel like they also aren't going to come in and challenge a grieving mother because they kind of, I kind of gave them the what for in the beginning. So I, in a way, I feel like they kind of just took it and were like, okay, great. Because they, what are they going to do, challenge me when I'm in that vulnerable position? So some of it I felt like was a little just kind of patronizing, but I do have to say I've had some really good conversations. My bishop now has a gay brother-in-law, so he's been a little, a lot more open to discussion and understanding. Um, we have a gay couple in our ward boundaries where we live now that they're very inclusive of in the ward, in the neighborhood. They don't participate in church, but in the neighborhood as a whole, um, they're very inclusive of this couple, and we'll wait and see when my my uh, rainbow flag goes up in June how much they love me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of been our experience from that. Over here. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people who are um, maybe aware of. Uh, A lot of them we feel like we would love to know what to do or what to say or like how to reach out or like how to help. But we're just like lost. We're like, I have no idea why I can do with these people. I'm curious if it, like in your experience, is there anything that you would suggest doing? If we like know of someone that we distantly know who is suffering. Who's lost su a child, or would you say, or just suffering like in the community or Yeah, I mean specifically for someone who's lost a child or lost a uh, family member or friend, um, 
what can we do? Like, what's the right thing to do? What's helpful? What's not helpful? For me, it's been um, acknowledging it that it's real. That that's you know just a friendly you know hey I'm thinking about you today. I mean, there's no you know I, I would go to counseling and I kept going thinking that she was going to give me the magic answer to make me feel better and it didn't make me feel better. It's not like I can take some medicine to make it go away. And so really just knowing that someone thinks about you and knows that, you know, the 27th of every month is another month. Because my daughter puts it closer to seeing him again. Um, but it's also, you know, 9.30 a.m. on a Monday morning is you can just, it's like you can feel your heart just drop. And it's its not even like, you know, you'll also go, what is wrong with me? And you'll look at the clock and you'll go, oh, that's what's wrong with me. And so, you know, just those kinds of things that, you know, I, I had this discussion with my brother. I'm like, you don't even call me. And, you know, he's like, well, I don't want to remind you. It's been nine months. And I'm like, do you really think I don't know? <laughs> So for me, it's, you know, recognizing that, you know, I know this must be hard, but, you know, I'm cheering you on for, you know, I'm grab a drink for something, you know, like that. I mean, I've gotten some of the, just from complete strangers, some of the kindest just notes via Facebook or other, you know, forms of social media that have just been, hey, you don't know me, but... So those are things that I appreciate. Yours might be different. You know, I, I quite honestly, I mean, I've had guys come to me or people come to me and go, you know, what am I supposed to say to you? And I go, I don't even know what to say. So I think that somebody saying, yeah, I don't know what to say, but I just, I wish I could do something. And that simply is pretty powerful. Yeah, I think that um, I can't do 
I mean, when they're this stupid, when you feel like they're like, like here, you can talk to them, but super stupid. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We've got really stupid in Utah. <laughs> she just oh, oh, defined it oh, oh. one sentence. <laughs> No, I think, you know, it's been interesting. We moved to a younger ward, and I will say that that has been a little bit more refreshing. Um, I think we are right on the cusps of Salt Lake City now, which, you know, I think most of these people, if they could afford to go right into Salt Lake City, they possibly would. They work in the city. And so it seems like we have seen a younger group of members in our ward, and so they seem to be a little bit more interested in the dialogue and the discussion as opposed to, um, you know, I, we, I grew up in the state that we previously lived in and um, cute President Irene was our neighbor. And so in some regards, I think we kind of walked a little line because he didn't, you know, because we, we were friends with both of his sons, um, Stuart and John. And you know they were absolutely wonderful um, with our son, but I think some of the leaders felt like they didn't want to get told on or didn't want him to hear that they maybe had crossed a line one way or the other. And so as a result, they just kind of kept it pretty vanilla. So I'm young men's president in my award, and I have a youth that is gay. What would you recommend for a young leader? You know, that's where I would probably put a lot of my eggs in that basket. I think um, that was one of my biggest sources of heartburn in our ward. Um, my son was not welcome. They did not want to talk about the young man that was gay, nor did they make any efforts to be inclusive and so for me obviously you're here so you understand the dynamic of the lgbt community which is huge um you understand that they can sleep in the same tent and be okay right <laughs> that was a problem with us we um, you know if he goes other kids other parents wouldn't allow their kids to go so so one, one quick comment real quick, Preston, I think one of the things really important is the fact that you're here. And I think that, um, you know, ignorance cannot, you know, you've got, at some point you've got to be willing to step into a space that you just don't understand. Well, you do know that gay kids don't like to play basketball, right? <laughs> I, I don't like basketball. I don't like basketball. <laughs> yeah. I kept telling them, I'm like, he is not going to show up if you play basketball every week. Now, cooking with the young women, he'll be there. <laughs> Just a thought, you know, you have to add it. Yeah, I guess my question, I'm, I'm Preston's wife, and we have a, a gay woman in our work, his, um, and our young women, and I'm in the young women's and so, um, one of my questions is is the level of inner I feel like we both try to do a pretty good job at supporting these youth and, and meeting them where they are, but at what level is any amount of interaction like hurtful to them? You know, in this case, you know, most of them are active, they're not necessarily coming to church and we invite them over to our home and, and kind of meet them where they are. But is there ever a point where even that is is harmful because we're we're also, you know, part of the church and um, I, don't know if I think you let them take the lead. I mean, I think you've got an expert on the back row back there. Right? Yeah. Aren't you an expert? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think you take their lead, though. I think, you know, like my son really, the minute he read the First Strength of You pamphlet when he was 12, and it said that homosexuality was a sin and that you needed to talk to your bishop, he turned off. Because he was sitting there going, wait a minute, I haven't done anything. I'm abominable, and I haven't even done anything. You know, that was his take on that. I dropped my fingers. So for him, he was done. And so I think you have to, but I, you know, the, the thing that was hard for me, and, you know, in hindsight, I felt like if I would have, I kind of put all my eggs in one basket, in the church basket. And I wanted my son to, to know of God and a Savior, and I put all my eggs in that basket, and that's my back. I should have 
been doing more for him to develop and gain that relationship separate and knowing that that was not connected to the LDS church. Just really Pardon? quick though. Uh, okay, yes, go. Oh. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah. Talk really loud, but. So, um, I think that through a leader, what's really helpful is what you said um, of meeting them where they are and then I'm going to take the role. Because for me, I have decided for myself I'm not doing it anymore. And for the leaders, I've let them know like I'm not interested and participating in the activities. Um, so, I appreciate it that they invited me to participate, but I also appreciate their respect of letting me choose what I want. So, but as the mom, <laughs> if, if, yeah. that's one thing that well, the coolest thing happened just uh, like two weeks ago. His Sunday school teacher, so Austin is an actor, he doesn't go to church. Um, and uh, he had hit it off, he didn't even realize that was a Sunday school teacher, just at one of the ward activities. And uh, they both share a love of art museums, and she, her family doesn't want to go. And so they talked about they should go sometime. And she made a point. Um, of following up, not just making that offer. And I actually caught her as an aside at church a few weeks ago and said, Austin's really excited to go. I just want to make sure that that this is a coming from a place. I know it turns out you're a Sunday school teacher and he never comes, ever. I just want to make sure that it's coming from a place you're not trying to actually get him to come to church because that's not feeling like where he's at and like that safe place for him right now. And that didn't matter at all to her. As a matter of fact, it turns out she shared with me that day, and I said, I wanted her to know that he's gay. You know, it's just for, for me as a mom, that's clear. And she didn't even miss a beat. She said, <laughs> she said, oh, that's nothing to me. I have a transgender brother, which I'm not sure very many people in the world even know. And she followed up, and they had the best day trip together at the museum, and there was nothing, there was nothing about that's contingent on, on Austin, I feel like you, this is just to get you to come to church. This so, is genuine. So, yeah, it's, it, it's a genuine yeah. connection with them. I mean, I used to say, my son swam, he played the guitar, and I used to say, you know, just invite him to come and show him how to do flip turns in the pool. And, or, you know, do those, make connections that aren't necessarily, they have to, they don't have to be church related. But to your point, his young man comes to base with me on Saturday. It's not about like backpacks, it's just wanted to make sure that right. yeah. like both of us as leaders that we're doing. Well and I think more you know and, and encouraging the other youth to be inclusive and understanding. That was the one thing that you know our young men would say to stuff and I can't associate with you because you're gay. Mm -hmm. And you know and that's not everywhere in Utah. That's not, <laughs> but I might tell you my experience. And in my, our experience, it was that. And so for him, it was very difficult for him to feel a sense of community. But yeah, that's, that was our experience for sure. Okay, I was trying to, I was going to be sarcastic and I'm answering your question. And I was going to say, telling to Ron, Run from the church. <laughs> okay. The only reason I was trying to do that, my, I have a gay son, and I've never seen him now happier since he left it only because there's no policy that destroys our LGBT kids. And this is what we need to understand. Sometimes we try to help the, the, our children, but the church can do a lot of damage unless the church changes to make it right for them. So what I noticed for my son, there's no way I would want him to be in the church right now unless they change, because he would go to church every Sunday and he would have anxiety, he would have panic attacks. So for him, that was toxic. So this is what we have to be very careful because even when I've gone to church, I watch certain kids and I watch and I think this kid is gay and I watch the anxiety that this poor kid has for the parents. So I think we can do a lot of damage. So I think what we're trying to do now, we have this hope that the church will change and have a place for our kids. But right now they don't. They don't right now. So we have to be very, very careful because we can give them false hope. And just to be clear, my son was not attending from about 13 and a half on. He was no longer participating. But I still, as a parent, and I, if 
you know, hearing you say so, that as a parent, I felt like that there was more connectors that could have been made that were non-religious, you know, overbearing with the religious part. We could have that just gen yeah, so that gen just genuinely said love. You know, I used to tell them all the time, I used to say, you know, my son is going to leave at 18 years old with one of two tastes in his mouth. And it's going to be that, you know, those leaders, they loved me, they cared about me, and they wanted me to be a part of them. I chose not to, but, you know, I knew that they genuinely wanted me to be a part, or he is going to look at it and never look back. And that's where he was. He was never looking back. We're going to take one more question. Nope. I got like three. Okay. Well. Okay. We'll do these three real quick. Okay. Here we go. So you know I love you guys. Oh, that's a preface to it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Don't raise yourselves. It's Kimberly. And I promise you I'm not trying to therapize. That's not my role tonight. But I want to back up about five minutes to a statement that you made about putting all your eggs in the church basket. And then you said something I felt was riddled with guilt and shame. You said the phrase, that was my bad. I think I'm the same age as you are. It's generational. We had no resources. We were given no options. It's all we knew. Please don't hold that guilt. Please don't harbor that shame. <coughs> You did the best you could with what you knew. Was Oprah say, when we know better, we do better. <laughs> we, do better we do better. And when you knew better, we did better. So please, from the bottom of my heart, as a parent, as a member of the community, please don't harbor that guilt. And now he's got a long time. <laughs> Wonderful. Rainbow from my mother's people. 
Oh, yep, one more right there. Yeah, so um, just this whole lot of topic is sort of the, the you know, you have a, a case on the issue. Kind of brings back an experience that I had um, where I was on a scout trip. And this is a, this is like a moment that like, I used to think about and I kind of like, kind of haunts a little bit, just to think of these leaders after came this way, but they made, it was at a scout camp, a scout, scout trip, and I had a youth leader make fun of a gay missionary campaign we had. He used a gay slur in the joke. And everybody laughed and everything. And I look back at that experience now, and think if I was, if I was a, you know, a gay scout on that trip, I'm not sure I want to come back to church again. Period. And so, and the more I think back about that experience, the more I get angry thinking about it because of the ignorance. And so, the question I have is what is going And first, I want to say I admire the like, hell out of you guys. Seriously, I want to but really, for coming here and being parents have had to deal with that challenge where you are in your time, I think. So, the question I want to ask you guys is are you guys getting opportunities to speak to? Youth leaders and youth fires, I, mean, I think that your story would do wonders in that particular part of the church because I think that if the youth knew that have more love and everything, then that would change so much. So are you guys getting opportunities to? Well, this is the first time that we agreed to kind of speak. So okay. I'm assuming that maybe those opportunities will come, but I'm not asking for them. Like I said, I'd rather use the bat. <laughs> no, that's not true. Well, kind of true. But no, we, you know, I mean, we've, we've shared, we've shared our story with the PR department and with the church. And, the, and so we do have some dialogues going, but it's not like we're trying to carry the church torch either. And we are wholly in the LGBT Mormon camp. So that's what we want to do is help our LGBT brothers and sisters that are LDS that they feel our love and support is where we're at. So thank you.
last thing is that uh, the next heart will be on April 30th.